got a couple here on their honeymoon. So, uh, you know, they just got married yesterday. And so that's, that's great. I, I've always thought of our church as the honeymoon destination. Uh, so, well, that's great. That's fantastic. Uh, today we're, uh, we're wrapping up. Hopefully I get all this stuff set up right. Uh, today we're wrapping up this little series on uh, dealing with dangerous people. And uh, it should go without saying that uh, one of the most important things about navigating uh, danger in this world is avoiding unnecessary danger. But just in case it needs to go with saying, let me say it, part of navigating, whoops, I can't even do this right. You, we can go back, how do you even go backwards on this thing? I don't even know. Do you know, is Ryan down here? Okay, that's perfectly fine. I don't know how to do, you know, I'm going to learn this thing so Ryan can get out of the booth upstairs because I don't know if you've noticed this, but his spiritual life has been plummeting off a cliff. No, it's not really, <laughs> not, not really, he gets old being up there. Part of navigating a dangerous world is, I think, avoiding unavoidable danger, okay? And there, there's lots of proverbs along these lines. Uh, the wise see danger ahead and avoid it, but fools keep going and get into trouble. Here's another proverb. The wise are cautious and avoid danger. Fools plunge ahead with reckless confidence. Of course, it's foolish to plunge ahead into avoidable danger. Okay, but the heart wants what the heart wants. Have y'all ever heard that one? The heart wants what the heart wants. But what if the heart is foolish? What if your heart is poisoned or toxic or has these little microbes? What if, what if your heart is fundamentally foolish? Probably shouldn't just follow your heart, right? I want to tell you a little story about General Custer, George Custer, one of the more famous foolish hearts in history. Uh, in the spring of 1867, he and his regiment were on this little scouting mission in Kansas just to check things out. And as he's out there on the, the plains of Kansas, his greyhounds, the, the, his English greyhounds, constant companions, took off after this group of antelope. Now he was a hunter and so his heart wanted what his heart wanted. He just instinctively took off. And he left his regiment behind. And so he's racing after his dogs that are racing after these antelope, and he forgets about his regiment behind him. And then he goes over this hill, and for the first time, he sees a buffalo, a big shaggy bull buffalo. And so he figures, I gotta, I gotta hunt this thing, this is my trophy. So he takes off after the buffalo, and his horse is running alongside this buffalo, and he pulls out his pearl handle pistol, and he, and he shoves it into the, the shaggy back of this bull buffalo. And then he pulls it back, in his words, to prolong the enjoyment of the moment. He was hearing his, the ragged breathing of his horse and the ragged breathing of the buffalo and the pounding beneath their feet. And he was just enjoying the moment. And this went on apparently for a couple of minutes. And then he decided, well, it's time to kill it. So he once again takes his pearl handle pistol, shoves it into the side of the buffalo. And, and for some reason the buffalo now instinctively knows what's about to happen. And so it turns into his, his horse and the horse jerks back to vo avoid the horns of the buffalo. And in that moment General Custer reaches for both reins, with, with, for the reins with both hands and he accidentally pulls the trigger and shoots his horse in the head, killing it instantly. Falls to the ground, gets up as quick as he can because he thinks he's going to have to face this buffalo which just moments earlier had been his intended prey. So the buffalo stares at this, you know, foolish little, little man, doesn't charge and just walks off. So his life is spared. But because of the, the chase and the run for several minutes, and because he's over the hill, and because of the plains, he's a little disoriented. And he has to embarrassingly, without a horse, walk back to his regiment, which was not exactly an easy task. Now you'd think, well, maybe he would learn a little something in this moment. But it would be less than 10 years that his foolish heart would lead him, you know, recklessly and impetuously 
uh, along with his entire regiment to their deaths on top of this little flat hill by this river called Little, little Bighorn. So, you know, follow your heart. Yeah, I know that, you know, we had a, we had a little cricket tell us that one time. In fact, we've got a hundred crickets around here probably joining in. You know, follow your heart, you know. Is that really such a good idea? Maybe before we follow our hearts, we ought to lead our hearts. Or put it a little bit differently. If you fail your heart, your heart's going to fail you. And everyone else around you in your particular leadership sphere. You see, the, the reality of the situation is uh, I'm the most dangerous person to me that I know. And probably you are the most dangerous person to you that, that you know. And I'm not trying to be unkind, okay, I'm in the same boat as everybody here, but let's just speak real plainly here. You and I have participated in every bad decision that we have ever made, right? Would you agree that for every bad choice you made, you were there? How many of you will admit that you're humble enough to admit you were there for your bad choices? Okay, that's like 70% of us are humble enough. That's, that's fantastic. The next series is going to be on humility. Okay, you were, you were there for every bad choice you ever made, okay? You, you were the one who talked you into yourself into going to that place or eating that or being with him or hanging out with her or not taking advantage of that. You were there for every bad choice you've ever made, okay? We, you and I, we were, you know, we were the chairman of the board. We, we, were, we were unfortunately the masterminds behind some of the greatest messes that our lives have ever been in, okay? So the reality for you, like the reality for me, is when we start thinking about dealing with, you know, dangerous people, we need to look in the mirror, okay? We need to be really, really careful. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't bad people out there, okay? But on the whole, probably when most people are at the end of the road and they measure their life and how they got hurt in this way and what happened there, and on the whole, statistically, most of the damage that you suffer is probably going to be at your own hands. That's kind of unfortunate. So we need to take the time to examine our hearts rather than simply following them. Maybe we need to lead them. And so this morning we're talking a little bit about leading self, or at least being in the posture where we can lead the self well. Okay. So we're going to look in the mirror and we're going to address those desires from within the heart. And uh, it's, it's a universal problem, uh, but there's hope. In fact, uh, the Apostle Peter is very hopeful in what he says to us this morning and very practical. And so with that, let's go ahead and stand out of respect for God who's speaking to us through His Word. This is 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, verses, uh, chapter 1, excuse me, verses 3 through 12. <laughs> Peter writes under the direction of the Holy Spirit, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these He has given us very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind, and has forgotten that he has cleansed, been cleansed uh, from his past sins. Therefore, my brothers, be all the more sure, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. 
May God bless the reading of His Word. You may be seated. Now, uh, the Apostle Peter at this point in his life is, is very old, okay? And when you get old and you're a believer, you know, really just, you, you just get old, you get very concerned about those who are younger. And if you're toward the end of your life, you're concerned about those who are apparently going to be outliving you. And so, uh, Peter, from this posture of wisdom, and I think concern, and this posture of, of love, is writing what he's writing. He's not a surly, you know, cranky old guy. I mean, he's filled with compassion when he talks to his readers about the, uh, the dangers and the weakness and the frailty of the human heart and these evil desires. And he's not just addressing the human heart in general. He's He's talking to them and addressing their weakness and, and the frailty of their own particular hearts. And, and please understand that when Peter addresses the weaknesses and faults of the human heart and Paul does the same and all the rest, they're not being unnecessarily negative. It just, it's just reality. Peter is writing from personal experience when he says these things. And, and actually he's being very complimentary because you'll notice in verse 12, which is the last verse of the section that we just read, he says, so I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. He says, I know you're mature. You're mature believers. You've been around. You're established in Christ. But because Peter knows his own heart, he says, I've got to remind you of these things that you already know. Now, let me just pause here for just a second. We're kind of do it an aside here. Sometimes People come to church because they're wanting to learn something new. And that's great. When you're a younger believer, you've got a lot that you're going you're gonna to learn. But then when you become a mature believer, you've been around for two decades, three decades, four decades, five decades, maybe longer. Now, why are you still coming to church? Beverly, haven't you learned enough yet? <laughs> no, no. Here's why. I, I think there's probably several Sundays where those of us who've been along for the journey for a while we go, it's like, I didn't necessarily learn anything today. But here's what happened. I got reminded. I got reminded of something that I needed to be reminded of. It's a truth I already have. And I hold tightly to this truth, and I'm already established in this truth. But I need to be reminded. You know how often? Every week, at least, probably every day. Sometimes those of us who are in the kind of the median stages, like you're a younger believer, well, I need to learn some things. And then you're an older believer, you go, well, I just need to be reminded of these things. There's sometimes there's a little drop off in that in-between stage. It's like, well, I've been a believer for three years and, and I didn't learn anything new today. I guess I just wasted my time. Well, no. No, you didn't. You haven't made it to the mature stage yet where you recognize that you don't have to learn something new every day. But you do need to be reminded, reminded specifically of the gospel. And that's why basically every, at least twice a month, we do observe communion where people just simply come and remember the body that was broken, the blood that was shed. And you say, well, I already knew that Jesus died for my sins. Yeah, that's not the point. The point is to be reminded. Jesus said, you do this in remembrance of me. Paul is saying, I need to remind you of these things that are very, very important for you to be reminded of. And, and Paul knows his own heart that he himself needs to be reminded of these things because Paul knows his heart can be strong and, you know, good one minute, and then not so good and, and weak the next. Paul's speaking from personal experience here, okay? Paul knows, hey, you can, you know, stand up for Jesus, and then, you know, shortly thereafter, deny Him. Peter, Peter knows from his own experience. He, he's the person who, you know, one minute is in cur courage and conviction, you know, raising a sword, and maybe wrongly, but in courage, cutting off the ear of that servant of the high priest. And then a few moments later, he's denying to a little girl that he even knows Jesus. This is, this is Peter, who basically is the first you know, major apostle who preaches the gospel to a non-Gentile group in Acts chapter 10. So he knows what it is to courageously be a cross-cultural missionary. And then, uh, you know, on another day, he knows what it's like to be rebuked by the Apostle Paul for cozying up to these Jewish Christians who want nothing to do with the Gentile Christians until they become a little bit more culturally Jewish. Peter knows from personal experience the heart needs to be like water, filtered again and again and again. We have to remember again and again and again. The heart needs attention. Because listen, if you do not tend to your own heart, your heart will be a danger to you. 
You say, well, you know, but, but it's okay now. Well, maybe. Have you looked at it lately? Okay. Have you, have you asked the Lord to search it? Or, well, I, you know, my, my heart health is, is perfectly fine. I used to, you know, I used to play basketball every day, two times a day. And it was just 40 years ago. You know, <laughs> oh, wait, wait. That's not how heart health works. You can't coast on how it used to be. Which, by the way, did you know that there was a period of time when people really didn't pay attention to their heart health at all? Physically speaking. It was just like, I want to read you something from a, from a cardiologist. I thought this was kind of interesting. Cardiologist, actually a professor of cardiology in, in Liverpool. Uh, let's see if I can skip ahead to this. He said, the greatest danger to a man with high, this is 1931, the greatest danger to a man with high blood pressure lies in its discovery, because then some fool is certain to try and reduce it. This is like, that's less than 100 years ago. That's just barely over 90 years ago. People thought, oh, this is not that big of a deal. This isn't that dangerous. You don't need to pay attention to heart health. And of course, there were terrible ramifications for this. And I want to tell you, there's terrible, terrible ramifications for you and for me when we don't pay attention to our spiritual heart health. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 says, The heart is more deceitful than anything else and incurable. Who can understand it? Don't deny it. Let's face it head on. So in the time that we have remaining this morning, I want us to ask the question, how do I deal with a dangerous heart? And the first thing that, that pops into mind is deal with it. Now, I know some of you who are like very critical on points. How do I deal with a dangerous heart? And the first, deal with it. That sounds like you're just taking a question and restating it as a statement. Are you running for president, Ernest? No. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was raised in a middle class home. I have bad, bad, bad humor. Uh, okay. Just, okay. Sorry. Sorry. Deal with it. Okay. It's like, what do you mean? Like, like de deal with it. Uh, you make the choice. You don't forget about it. You handle your business. You, you press in on it. Where do I see this? In verse 5, uh, there's, this, there's this moment where, where uh, Peter says, look, look, you've got you to gotta add to your faith all these other things. You add to your faith, um, you know, uh, goodness, and add to that knowledge, and you add to that self-control, and you add to that perseverance, you add to that godliness, and you add to that brotherly kindness, and you add on top of that love. And after he says all these other things that you need to be doing, look at what he says in verse 8. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's letting them know, un unless you're growing, okay, visibly, concretely, measurably, you're going to be ineffective, unproductive, nearsighted, blind with regards to your knowledge of Jesus Christ. You're either moving forward or you're, or you're moving backwards. you you got to lean in, put forth some effort, get it done. Paul is saying no matter how long you've been a Christian, no matter how moral you are, no matter how you know, doctrinally trained you are, uh, no matter how wise you are, you've got to keep growing or you're going to be declining. You've got to be putting in the work you don't just let it ride. That's a foolish way to go at life. So you need to handle your business, deal with it. But also, if, by the way, if you're a parent, you need to help your children to handle their business with their heart too. Um, like I came across this. This is a really very, very old quote. But some of y'all, you remember Columbine. Who doesn't? I mean, that's when everything got kicked off. And the mother of Dylan Klebold, Susan Klebold, uh, felt, you know, obviously incredibly terrible about what had happened. And about a decade after Columbine, she had this to say about her responsibility or her having fallen short with regards to protecting or caring for her son's heart. She said, Dylan was a product of my life's work, but his final actions implied that he had never been taught the fundamentals of right and wrong. There was no way to atone for my son's behavior. In raising Dylan, I taught him how to protect himself from a host of dangers, lightning, snake bites, head injuries, skin cancer, smoking, drinking, sexually transmitted diseases, drug addiction, reckless driving, even carbon monoxide poisoning. 
It never occurred to me that the gravest danger to him, and as it turned out to many others, might come from within. Look, you, you handle your business, you, you deal with it, you don't avoid it, you, 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 and you help your children to do the same. And I know that, that actually dealing with it and going head on and, and dealing with your heart, and, and what I mean is not just on a superficial level. For some of us, actually we may need to do the hard work of uprooting bitterness. Some of us we need to do the hard work of forgiveness. Some of us need to do the hard work of confession and repentance, and these are very, very painful things. But if your heart is twisted, if it is dark, you cannot trust it. And, you, and if you can't trust yourself, who can you trust? Okay. Well, you can trust the Lord, but on a day-by-day, moment-by-moment moving through life, you need to be in a centered position. And I'm telling you, if you've got weeds of of distrust and discontent and anger and bitterness and resentment, you need to do the hard work. And it is worky what God requires of us to deal with it. There's this statement in James, and it's very straightforward. It doesn't really require any commentary, so I'm just going to read this. He says, Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. See, nobody else is fooled by, by the hypocrisy. Because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like someone looking at his own face in a mirror. For he looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of person he was. But the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer who works, handles their business, this person will be blessed in what he does. You see the truth. You deal with it honestly and you move forward. Proverbs 27, 19, as a face is reflected in water, so the heart reflects the real person. Look at yourself. Look at yourself honestly. Do the work. Confess. Repent. Move forward. Forgive if you have to. Get a Christian counselor if you have to. But you do the work that's necessary. Okay, that's the first thing. You, you deal with it. Okay, but there's, but there's more. Number two, you remember the gospel. Your heart, like my heart, is resistant to truth. Okay, I'm going to go slow on this because this is real important. Your heart is resistant to truth. There are there are things that are beautiful that you that you want to come into full view, and you'll try to focus. But I'm telling you very very quickly, you lose focus on what's beautiful. Or or put it a little bit differently. Um, you may have a very strong conviction, uh, but it's amazing how the heart loses conviction very, very quickly. You'll, it, the conviction fades. There are things that you thought as a child you'd never do, and you did them. There are things you thought, I'll never change my mind, and then you change your mind, or you, you, you change your heart. Uh, we're, we're resistant to, to what is true, what is beautiful, what is admirable, what is, what's no, no, noteworthy, what's excellent, what's true. And you lose hold of what you shouldn't. That's the nature of your heart. Here's how Paul and, or Peter encourages them. So I will always remind you of these things. Put that up there. So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth that you now have. You've just got this tendency to forget things that you shouldn't forget. Okay, I, I was I was thinking about this a little bit about forgetfulness, and I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> I'm sorry, no. Uh, you know, those of us who keep how many of you here keep a journal or a diary? I'm kind of curious. Anybody? Okay, one, two, a, f- a few of us. You know, what's kind of interesting. People who keep journals or diaries will go back like a year later and they go, "Oh, I forgot that that ever happened." And most of the time, it's the beautiful things. Okay, there was a joyous moment, or there was an encouraging word, or, you know, there was this, I don't know, ser- serendipitous moment, or whatever, you, 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 you journal those things, you write them down. If you don't write them down, you don't remember them. You know, you just, unless you're, unless you're taking pictures, or you've got like a Facebook timeline you keep track of, or a photo album, or whatever, the good things, the beautiful things, the joyous moments, you kind of forget about until you go back a year later or a couple of years later and go, oh, I forgot that, that life could be that joyous. 
because you go back and look. Now, I'm not one of these people who writes a lot of things down, but as I was thinking this through, I thought, I probably need to start writing more of these things down. Fortunately, I have friends that kind of remind me of some things. I ran into a guy, uh, Andy Russell, this is like eight days ago in the grocery store, and he's a very, he's, he's well along in years. I, I did the marriage for he, him and his wife and the wedding, and shortly thereafter, she, she discovered she had Alzheimer's. And, uh, and then she had a couple of strokes over the last course of the year. And anyway, I caught up, and, and she's now, you know, assisted living, he sees her every day. And it was kind of a, kind of a dark moment, but it was actually precious because we got to remember. We, he remembered the service, and he remembered some of the counsel, and, and we got to remember together. And you go back, and you think about how beautiful these moments are, and you would have forgotten them if had, somebody hadn't reminded you, if you hadn't read it. And you know how it is. But I can tell you this, when it comes to the dark moments in your life, when it comes to your heartbreak, when it comes to the disappointment, when it comes to anxiety, you didn't have to take a picture. You didn't have to write that down in a journal. You didn't have to put that down in your diary or on your timeline. In fact, sometimes in the middle of the night, you'll wake up and your mind is replaying that event from five years ago, or 10 years ago, or 20 years ago. You, you don't need to record that. The, the point is, it's like, it's like your heart has double-sided tape around it for all the dark and ugly, despicable, heartbreaking, hurtful things. But when it comes to the beautiful things, the noble things, it's like your heart's got Teflon on it. And so we're encouraged to intentionally remember some things. This is, this, is how, this is how it's put over in Philippians. Paul puts it like this. He says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. He's commanding them to remember these things. They already know to be true and right and praiseworthy and excellent and all the rest. You know why this is so important? To remember the good stuff. Okay, and it all spins off the gospel. If you remember the affirmations and the, the encouragement that you received, your heart is going to be confident. And if you remember the mercies that you've received, you're going to have a grateful heart. And if you remember the help that was given you, the helpful advice or the helpful hand, you're going to have a humble heart. I want a humble, grateful, you know, thankful confident heart, but without intentionally again and again and again meditating on these things and focusing on things, here's what my heart does, focuses on the hurt and the betrayal. And if your heart does what it naturally does, which it naturally does this, you're going to have a twisted, ungrateful, bitter, uh, cynical heart. So you know what this means? This means if you're not intentionally doing what we're encouraged to do, to remember, and to remember well, and to remember the good, and to focus on the gospel, if you're not remembering again and again and again and again the right things and intentionally filtering your heart, your heart is going to be out of touch with reality. That means on its own, without remembering the, the pure and the right and the good and the noble and the excellent and the praiseworthy, without digging into what it is that you know is true about the gospel, that, the, the truth that you've been established in, if you're not working that into your mind again and again and again, your heart will be insane. Really, I'm not exaggerating. A heart that's out of touch with reality is an insane heart. I was talking a little bit about this on Wednesday night in so many words, just like, you know, people are worried about or concerned worried maybe, you know, about our nation. You know what, what our nation needs more than anything else? It's revival. It's spiritual awakening. It's the gospel. It's for our hearts to be turned toward the Lord. I'm not saying that, that the issues and, and government personnel aren't important, but no clever combination of bad eggs ever made for a good omelet. You know what needs to happen? The individuals need to turn their lives to God. They need to have the truth. They need to have what's true and right and excellent and praiseworthy because a, a heart that's out of touch with the gospel and the goodness of God is a heart that's insane 
and you look around this world, you go, man, is, is everybody out of touch with reality? Is everybody insane? You know what the solution is? It's the gospel. Well, that's the solution. We can see that solution for other people. But what about for ourselves? You want to straighten out your heart? Okay. Do the work. Remember the gospel. And there's two other things that we'll shoot through these really quickly. They're very short points for those of us who are in a hurry. And I get it. Look, look, look I, I know. I promise you will be out by 1 o'clock. <laughs> really, I guarantee it. Every, I, in fact, if you're relatively new and you want to come back for a second honeymoon in a year, we will always be out of here by 1 o'clock. Pretty sure. Anyways, uh, look, besides this, okay, I, have to, I have to mention this thing, thing too. You know, part of, part of the meditation on the gospel is not just looking at Jesus, okay, that's good that we look at Jesus and we see the truth, but meditating on the truth is a little bit different. You're, you're not just, the, the goal of the Christian is not just to see Jesus appropriately, it's to put yourself in a position where you start seeing everything through Jesus, where He becomes the lens through which you look at everything else, because until you attain that, as the Scripture puts it, you'll be nearsighted and blind having forgotten that you've been cleansed from your past sins. You want, don't want to just know the gospel. You want to get to the point where you're seeing everything through the gospel. That's the goal. Okay, how do I deal with my dangerous heart? Number three, add, then add some more. Let's go back to what the Scripture says. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. Make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance. And to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, look, Christianity does not start with you doing anything, okay? It starts with you receiving Jesus, it starts with you receiving His life, okay? This is true, but just because you get first things first, doesn't mean second things don't come second. What I mean is, there's a lot of working the gospel into your life, and there's a lot of working so that the gospel comes through clearly in your life. You know what it takes to really remember the gracious presence of Jesus Christ in your life in such a way that it is functionally, operationally significant? You know what it means to, to really experience the presence of Jesus in your life so that the presence of Jesus in your life really does drive everything about you, what you think, what you say, what you do. Here's what it, here's what it takes. It takes effort. It takes showing up for the Word and for prayer and for Christian fellowship consistently on, in an ongoing basis until the gospel gets so worked into the fibers of who you are, you start seeing everything through the light of it. It takes the, the effort of certain disciplines that have been practiced over centuries, okay? There's the discipline of Bible study. That's going deep. There's a different discipline of just simple Bible reading. That's, you read for breadth, you study for depth. It, it, there's a discipline of prayer. There's a discipline of meditation where you take truths that you already know and you meditate on them and ruminate them. And then when you think you've chewed them up, you chew them up again and you suck the taste out of it. I mean, the, there's the meditation. It's the active mind. There's also these, these other disciplines of gathering together with your church family on a regular basis for corporate worship in its various forms. And there's the discipline of simplicity over materialism and the discipline of honesty and transparency over dishonesty, and there's the discipline of purity over sexual license, and there's the, there's the, the discipline of, of, of generosity and, and, and service over manipulation and power. You look at the people around you, or the people in your history, parents or grandparents, or people that you thought they were just godly and on fire for Jesus, and you know what you're going to find? You're going to find people who made every effort to work Jesus into their life and to work Jesus out of their life. You receive Jesus. That's how it starts. But just because you get first things first doesn't mean that there's not effort thereafter so as to work Jesus in and through your life. Make every effort, the Scripture says, to add to your faith goodness and to add to that knowledge. And then you make every effort to add on top of, of that 
self-control. You make every effort on top of that, you know, perseverance. And on top of that, godliness. On top of that, you, you make every effort, you know, for brotherly kindness. On top of that, you make every effort toward love. You make every effort. And so let me just ask you the question, how's your effort level? On a scale of 1 to 10, where do you want your effort level to be? Hopefully a 10. Some of us are like, yeah, I don't, you know, have an 8 something. But where is your effort level? It requires effort, which by the way, this is at the heart of discipleship, actually, effort. It's not just Christian education, which let me just put a, put a plug in here. I know I'm plugging all over the place, but let me just put a plug in. Uh, the adult Bible studies are, are so good, just going, just going verse by verse through the, through the Bible. You ought to show up here on Sunday, on Sunday mornings if you're at all able. The, the studies are, are great uh, with Tom. Uh, that's the truth. They're really, really good. I've enjoyed those. There's a lot to be said for Bible study, and hopefully you do learn a few things here on Sundays. Who knows? But it's not just Christian education. It's teaching people not just the commands, not just the doctrine. It's teaching them to obey. That's different. That's effortful. Jesus says, go and make disciples. Yeah, that's the point. Baptizing them, okay, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you don't do much there, you just, you know, you get dunked, you get taken under. That's the initiation experience. You didn't do anything. But then also teaching them the commands. No, that's not what Jesus says. Teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded. That's different than just education. It's the difference between knowing how to do squats and doing them. Okay? Those of you who've been in athletics or you're still in athletics, if you're, if you're, okay, do we have some people here that are involved? We've got some people who are involved in athletics. I'm telling you, it doesn't matter if it's football, basketball, volleyball, softball, baseball, if you're in team sports, you better be doing squats or you're not doing it right. But you can know how to do them, and it's so much more fun to watch a video of somebody else squatting than squatting. Okay? But if you're not actually squatting, you're not doing squat. Okay? Okay, that was a motive. <laughs> I'm sorry, that would, I didn't intend for that to be a joke. It's just accidental. Okay, so teaching them to obey. There's effort. How's the effort level? If you're not putting effort into this thing and you're not adding and adding and adding, you're going backwards. And your heart might have been really good when you were 16 like mine was 40 years ago, but you better keep exerting the effort. That's not earning his favor. That's just being good steward of what God has given you so that Jesus will come through loud and clear in your life and through your life. Okay. Finally, number, number four, one more thing. If you want to deal with a dangerous heart, get your test, heart tested regularly. And I don't mean go to a pharmacy or a wellness center, okay. There is someone who can test your heart really well, okay. The heart is more deceitful than anything else, the Scripture says, and incurable. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, examine the mind and test the heart. Psalm 139, 23 through 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. And see if there's any hurtful way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. Go to the Lord. Do the, do the work of the self-examination. And I'm telling if you, if you do follow these things, if you, you deal with your heart honestly and head on, and, and then you're remembering the gospel and you're pressing in and you're, and you're coming to services, but also, you know, devotional time or radio and all the rest, and you're doing this so as to remember the gospel and Jesus and His goodness in your life. And then if on top of that, you're really working, you know, to, to grow as a believer and work the gospel in so that it becomes the lens through which you look at everything else. And if you're going to God and saying, search me, try me. Test me. I'm telling you, it'll straighten out your heart, and you'll be glad you did it. And, and actually, so will everybody else around you who's depending on your leadership. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Uh, God, we thank you so much for your word and for your instruction and for the capacity that you give us to have hearts that we really can trust, but we have to entrust them to you. So, Lord, help us to do that, because we look, really do live in a dangerous world, but the overlooked danger commonly is uh, the, those evil desires from within, and the heart that is untested and untrained and unexamined and unaddressed. When we don't tend to our hearts, we 
tend to be the biggest danger to ourselves. So, Lord, just lead us in the way everlasting. Help us to take, uh, take that I internal part and, 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 and deal with it rightly. And, Lord, of course, we know that uh, at the beginning of the, of the whole journey is uh, entrusting our heart to someone with the right heart. And, uh, and we know there is one heart we can trust wholeheartedly without reservation, and that's yours. Even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Even when we were your enemies, uh, you were our friend. So, Lord, thank you for the heart that you've put on display for us. Thank you for being a God that we can trust because you've held nothing back from us, not even your, your son. And maybe, just maybe, there's someone here this morning who has yet to entrust their heart to yours. And that might be the first real, first practical step is not necessarily doing anything, but receiving uh, what you've done for them. And so every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around here. If, if you're here this morning and you say, you know, I know I need to, to trust the heart of God displayed specifically in the Son, Jesus Christ, but I've never entrusted my heart to His. Maybe this is the morning to do that. Maybe this morning you'd say, you know, God, I, I've, I've tried doing things on my own. It's not really working so well. And, and the reality is, I need someone I can follow besides me. Leading self isn't working so much. I need someone to help me along the path. And God, I know that's you. And, and God, I know you sent your son. And he lived the life I should have lived and died the death I should have died so that I'd be forgiven all my sins and cleansed from all of my unrighteousness. So God, this morning, I want to start my journey with you by trusting Jesus as my Lord, my leader, my Savior. If you're here this morning and that's you, I'm just going to lead you in a prayer right where you are. You've, maybe you've never trusted Jesus, but you just simply say this to God. God, I know I've sinned. God, I know I've fallen short. I know I need forgiveness. But I also know, God, your heart is to forgive me. And you made it possible through Jesus who died on the cross for my sin. And so right now, I trust Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I turn from my sin and selfishness, and I just trust in Jesus and in Jesus alone to be my leader, my healer, my Savior, my Lord. Thank you, God, in Jesus' name, amen.